Welcome to this week's edition from Freedom and Prosperity Radio. We put together here at the Virginia Institute for Public Policy so that you go off into your day with some good answers on the themes and the things that challenge us beyond who's just running for an office. Uh, As we approach that one month to go to Election Day, there are some heavy things beyond newspaper articles about tax returns and Supreme Court nominees, as much as you'd think that that consumes our day. Our first guest this week, editorial director of the Thomas Fordham Institute uh, and a co-author of a brand new book, along with Frederick Hess at the American Enterprise Institute, is called Getting the Most Bang for the Education Buck. And I think this is an important story as we get, are getting close into October now. Uh, we're starting to kind of get settled into the online learning and what are we getting for our tax dollars and what is being spent and for what. Uh, Brandon, welcome to this week's edition of Freedom and Prosperity Radio. How are you, sir? Hey, good. Uh, Thanks for having me. Not at all. Uh, And it was certainly not as sexy as somebody's tax returns, but I think, you know, on a substantive (laughs) level, this is really what Americans are waking up to and perhaps more than anything else, what uh, a lot of the big government advocates are afraid of is that we're going to realize, well, what exactly did we need all this public school spending for? Uh, So so talk about it. Is that the theme? Is that what got you guys to take pen in hand and write this book? Uh. Somewhat. So it's not entirely that, you know, schools don't need funding, um, right? Schools do need adequate funding. Mm -hmm. uh, And that's an important conversation. But unfortunately, that that question, do schools have enough, pretty much dominates the whole budget debate. Mm -hmm. And that's a big problem because an equally important, if not more important question is how the dollars that schools get are spent. Right. And that applies even if schools have a ton of money or they don't have enough. It, it's, it's always an important question, yet it basically isn't ever talked about. So that, that most specifically was the basis of this book. And so frequently you'll get the heartwarming story in the news of some cum laude uh, graduate of some Ivy League school that came from some inner city public school system, which I always feel like says, well, you see, it isn't about the money because these are, you know, struggling and often underfunded or under, you know, supported school districts. And yet there are brilliant people that come out of them uh, often overcoming the odds, which makes it a great uh, story. But in many parts of Virginia, schools are going to dominate. 70%, uh, between 60 and 70% of the county or city's budget. Yeah, yes. Uh, In a lot of places, schools definitely do get a lot. Uh, The United States spent something like $14,000 per student, which is among the most in the developed world, Um, Mm. which I guess uh, would uh, mean it's among the most in the world. Um, Anyway, uh, yeah, so we already do spend a lot. Um, And there are places, you know, that spend double triple that even, Mm -hmm. Um, basically uh, urban schools. So the interesting thing right now, uh, right, is that that's going to be strained. Uh, The pandemic, right, um, is going to make it so that school budgets are either reduced or capped Mm -hmm. um, for a very long time. We saw this uh, after 2009. Um, And interestingly, I mean, that's that's the the reason for that is obviously a very tragic thing. Um, But there is a silver lining there. In that we found that certain school districts after 2009, when the economy crashed, uh, that gave them sort of the the leverage to finally get uh, budgetary reforms and um, policies passed. That finally sort of did more with their dollars. Um, before that, right, their opponents would always say, "No, that's not the question. We just need more. Why? Why? Why don't we have more?" They realized. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because of the economic crisis then, and it'll apply now, that they weren't going to get that. So that went away. Um, and it opened the doors for these, for these uh, ambitious and great people in charge um, to uh, finally get more bang sort of out of their education book. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in the book, we talk about this happening in Miami-Dade County. Um, so a big, big school district, urban school district, um, they were able to get this done. Um, so it's sort of a great, great uh, proof point for this. 
in this compilation of stories that prove that your know, your point on this, you, you you mentioned how much of our debate is often about the dollar figure. I, for years, I worked in Pennsylvania, uh, where the tax rates, the property tax rates, are actually set by the school board. Um, beyond uh, and and I had a dear friend, great educator, multiple postgraduate degrees in education and and uh, motivation, and got himself elected to school board. And quit in six months. He said, we never discuss education. All it is is mill rate and and why is my property tax? And I think that goes into what you were talking about at the onset is that we're not talking about how how is it we spend so much and wind up with declining test scores and STEM, uh, or I guess it's STEAM uh, scores uh, and, uh, and disciplines, Brandon. Yeah, so we talk about this a lot, right? School spending has gone up um, hugely, but a lot of that isn't actually going to anything that affects the classroom. So it's not even just that the money being spent on classrooms isn't effective. It's that these increased dollars aren't being spent there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Great examples um, of this is uh, with pensions and health care. Across the 50 states, uh, there's something like $500 billion in unfunded pension debt for public employees, which uh, obviously includes mm. school teachers, right. uh, just thirty cents of every dollar spent on this actually goes to current employees. Seven wow. percent of healthcare, only seven percent is actually covered. Um, so you have these new employees coming into a system that's already sh- struggling to pay its bills, or it just isn't, mm-hmm. and you're giving new employees pensions for life and healthcare for life, and heck. If I was an employee and I got hired and my employer offered me that, that'd be fantastic, right? But but for it to be tenable, for it to actually be sustainable, um, they would have to be able to afford it. Mm-hmm. And they simply cannot afford it, yet they're still doing it. Um, another great example, uh, or bad example, I guess, um, is how much money we're spending on non-instructional staff. We've seen this huge increase in the number of people, mm-hmm. adults, on district's payroll we haven't seen class sizes go down. We haven't seen teacher salaries go up. Instead, we're just hiring more and more people that aren't actually affecting the things kids learn. Um, so these three things are talked about in essentially uh, three different mm-hmm. uh, chapters out of our nine. And, yeah, they're, they're, they're a huge problem, but they, they, they answer sort of the quandary that you brought up in your question. How are we spending all, all of this but getting such a mediocre product? And that's a big part of why. Well, and we've seen it here. We have six-figure, you know, uh, you know, executive staff at these uh, school districts that never darken a classroom door, and and that's the. You know, it seems inverted. We're the most important purveyor of the product. If we look at education as an enterprise, Brandon, uh, wouldn't the most important employee be the one in the classroom with the teacher since that's what your you know, whole mission statement is for the enterprise and therefore shouldn't they be the ones that are you know given the most in compensation and the folks who sort of make sure you know the paperwork is filed on time they can they can be more of an entry level position without having to you know command a six figure salary uh, it seems like it's an inverted pyramid yeah yeah i mean we see this with sports right the the best players make more than the coach Right. right, because they're actually affecting things most. And yeah, so uh, one one great idea that that um, our our staff chapter has, and uh, it's an edited volume. So each chapter is actually written by different authors. Um, okay. This is written by uh, Brian and Emily Hassel, and uh, they suggest that to value teachers more and to spend less and get more, uh, instead of this sort of always one teacher one classroom, every teacher basically um, makes the same based on their experience. Instead. Uh, and districts have done this and done it well, they suggest this sort of team approach where you actually find who your best teachers are, and these teachers end up leading teams of, say, a handful of educators, and they still continue to to teach part of the time. Mm -hmm. But the other part, they are actually sort of coaching and overseeing and helping these teachers who aren't as good as them yet Mm -hmm. um, sort of do more for their kids. And, like you said, you actually end up paying these star educators more. So they continue to teach. They're affecting even more classrooms and more kids. They make more, and they are taking uh, the roles that are currently filled by these sort of non-teaching staff whose job it is to, like, watch teachers teach and evaluate them, but they're not actually teachers themselves. 
it's a very sort of strange approach mm -hmm. um, when you have this option. So, uh, yeah, that's a great idea. Getting the most bang for the education buck. It's co-edited work. Uh, Brandon Wright is on with us from the Fordham, Fordham Institute, and it's Fordham Institute. Dot org, uh, Brandon, I appreciate your visit with us and talking about this because it really does uh, come down to it. And teaching being such an important, you know, it's really an art form. Being able to stand in front of, uh, you choose the school district size, 20 to 30 disinterested you know, semi-adolescents and engage them and try to find out what fires up each one of them. Uh, I, I think it's almost mystical uh, from where I stand point, uh, my standpoint point is so you know successful teachers should be you know, encouraged to stay in the classroom and and that story you were just telling us is certainly seems to lead to that because we hear more and more about how especially in the more heavily unionized school divisions but I think we're getting hit with it here in Virginia the best teachers are told well there's a there's a ceiling to how much you know you can earn as a teacher uh, and that you know the real you know good wages and good benefits are when you leave teaching and become an administrator and I, that seems like a reverse incentive, doesn't it? Yeah, it, 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 it always has seemed uh, strange to me that the unions are sort of pretty uniformly opposed to merit pay. Um, I completely get that they would want, you know, adequate pay for every, mm -hmm. every uh, teacher who belongs to them. Um, but to not want the best to make as much as possible uh, seems, seems very strange. Uh, again, the, you think about sports. Um, these players have like an X amount that like, like they, they at least make that much, but there's no cap, right? Mm -hmm. So one player can make 500,000 and the best quarterback in the country is making $50 million a year, right? When you have a great teacher, you should be able to recognize him or her and award them. And you just can't right now, which like you said, seems very strange. Would, <laughs> Would a, a school choice campaign, a real one where parents, not even just public-private, but e even within the public schools, be able to choose to send their kids to school districts that perform better as a rule, not just kind of arbitrarily where their home you know, is particularly located, um, would that help drive some of that where schools would want to pay their teachers better because it would mean more people are trying to enroll in those schools? Sure. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm a big uh, believer in how choice uh, increases competition, and that competition, when regulated well, is a very good thing. Um, so that's also another silver lining to this terrible pandemic. We've seen sort of uh, a, an unprecedented increase in interest in in parent choice um, from parents. Mm -hmm. uh, seen way more parents thinking about homeschooling or way more parents pulling their kids out of uh, school A and enrolling them in school B or trying to find a new place, changing to charters, private. Um, so the more you can facilitate these choices by allowing, for example, more high-quality charter schools to open or allowing um, voucher programs to uh, be created wherein low-income families can actually send their kids to private schools that they wouldn't otherwise be able to afford, the more you get this choice, the more parents, um, you know, will be able to find the best fit for their kids, for their values, um, and the more competition that you actually have, which puts pressure on sort of every one of these school types mm -hmm. to uh, provide the best product possible. So, yeah, in, 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 in a place where, you know, it's a low-income public school district, there aren't really any charters, or the charters are already, you know, overflowing. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have a voucher program, then, you know, these low-income families can only send their kids to the neighborhood school. So the neighborhood school doesn't really have any pressure to right. improve their education. Um, and again, that also is backwards. So let me ask you this, Brandon. You know, you mentioned you know sort of the silver linings we're seeing educationally out of this pandemic because school districts haven't been willing to bring their kids back into the classroom and parents have you know, whether they wanted to or not, become 
uh, more a part of the process and they're kind of seeing behind the curtain, I guess, a little bit uh, for, for what they're getting. What do you foresee is the future? I've argued that in general, our economy is not going to be the same when we finally put COVID-19 uh, at least as, as a, a lockdown, a closure issue in the rear view mirror, even if it still exists as a virus. Um, you know, and we start to go back to things. I think there are going to be issues with, you know, how many restaurants do you need? How many hotels do you need? And there's going to be some challenges uh, to that. What do you see as the overall longstanding impact to public education and, and even to a degree private education from that? So I do think there is going to be sort of permanently more interest and more demand for choice. Um, you're going to see more kids uh, homeschooled and certain families are like, hey, actually, like this. I think this works well um, Mm -hmm. for my kids. Or like, hey, I changed to this school. Or, hey, like my friend who lives in, you know, one state over, they have all these options and I don't. Why is that? We need more options. Um, So I do think there'll be more and more interest in that. Um, There could be sort of more interest in creative approaches to education. Probably heard a lot about these sort of pods that that, that certain parents have um, created during this, wherein sort of small groups of kids uh, get together and they get basically tutored. Mm -hmm. Um, That could be something you see uh, more of. But aside from, I think, these sort of gradual um, positive increases, I do think that when things are safe, um, that parents will sort of want to an extent, or at least a large amount of parents will want to an extent what they had before where they send their kids to a school where they get picked up by a bus and they, and you know, the parent then goes to work and, and back to this routine that I feel like this pandemic um, has made us, you know, miss so much. Uh, It has, you know, caused us to appreciate the things that we had before that we didn't appreciate. Um, Mm -hmm. We wish we had them now. So um, I don't think there'll be these, these, you know, tectonic, you know, seismic shifts. Um, I do think there will be um, the ones I talked about, but I do think that when things are back to being safe, that you'll see more of sort of what we saw before with these little tweaks. You mentioned the 2007, 2008 and the downturn there. Uh, and we're talking about the uh, book, How Do You Get the Most, uh, Get We're Getting the Most Bang for the Education uh, Buck. And you talked about how uh, tax revenue had become constricted. And I think that's going to be an impact, though, uh, is I, I don't know how much commerce we're going to do. So uh, certainly property tax uh, values may go down in the inner city, may go up in the suburbs. We're seeing sort of a a, a migration from cities to suburbs um, and more rural communities. Um, so is that going to be a challenge for the inner city schools to you know, make sure that, you know, in some cases already 60, 70 cents out of every uh, tax dollar is going to schools if properties start to be uh, you know, moved out of and, and there's a flight from the cities, where's that revenue going to come from? Yeah, uh, and yeah, so you're basically talking about uh, declining um, enrollments, which uh, we actually have a whole chapter on, um, okay. written yeah. by, uh, by, by the president of uh, Education Resource Strategies. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, um, it's sort of, it was, it was already a growing problem, and it's just going to get worse um, as people, you know, move to places where the cost to live isn't so high. Mm. Uh, and the struggle for schools here is say that it's been $14,000, Per kid, if that kid leaves, it's not like their 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 costs go down fourteen thousand, right? There there's there's this you know um, economy of scale. So uh, so people talk a lot about you know the money following the kid, and I generally think that should be true. Um, but when en- enrollment declines in a school that's already struggling to pay its bills and you know provide an adequate education. Uh, it really is a struggle. Um, mm-hmm. So they have to get creative. They have to, you know, do things with combining classes and do creative things with with teachers. The chapter goes into it a lot, um, a lot better than 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 I could. So I guess I will suggest that people sure uh, get the book and mm-hmm. read that chapter. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a big problem. But it, there is a way to address it. Um, other districts already have. Um, they already are. 
Uh, so it's not, you know, the end of the world, but it's it's a serious problem. It is the best place to get it at FordhamInstitute.org, or can we order it through Amazon? Where is the best place to get this book, Brandon? Yeah, uh, it's available anywhere you buy your books. So um, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, there's an ebook on the publisher's site. The publisher is Teachers College Press. Um, so yeah, uh, and our our site has a page that will redirect you to to you know excellent these purchases. Yeah, uh, I've been talking quite a bit about 2021. Uh, I know that certainly the presidential and congressional elections um, in 2020 have taken a lot of attention away, but in 2021 across the Commonwealth of Virginia. Upwards of 50 percent of all school board seats are going to be up for election. Um, and I think that that is an important thing for parents to be interested in, uh, though it rarely gets any attention in the media because of these you know, big elections that sort of suck the media air out of the room. What recommendations can you give to a parent uh, who might be sitting here listening to us saying, yeah, I really think, you know, I should get involved more um, you know, not just as running for office, but looking for ways to influence those who hold those offices and, and make sure that their school boards are not just trying to go back to, you know, snafu, as it were. Yeah, so that's a really important point. Um, with school boards, like, they don't just not get attention in the media. They don't really get attention from parents or the communities. Um, these seats tend to be filled by by people who already, you know, have power. And so they just sort of protect their power by getting, you know, people on the board who are sort of uh, aligned to them. Um, Mm -hmm. You see this basically everywhere. So uh, actually paying attention to school board elections, you don't have to run yourself, right, but but, but actually caring about who is uh, a candidate and why they are and what their values are, it's very important. Parents can also, you know, obviously get involved by just making uh, their their concerns known. Um, you see, actually, this 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 huge gap between sort of affluent schools and low income schools in terms of the power that parents have. So when you go to an affluent school, uh, these parents, even when they're not even on a PTA, just parents in general, they are so vocal with teachers and principals. Um, that they, in a large way, uh, control a lot of what goes on or doesn't go on in that school. You see basically Mm -hmm. the opposite in low-income schools where parents have basically no power. Um, And so the takeaway from that is if parents and their fellow parents and their community, everyone's sort of there, you know, can organize and, you know, put pressure on those in charge, change isn't just possible, it's, it's, almost guaranteed. It happens Mm -hmm. all the time in communities across the country. Um, So just being involved, being aware um, makes um, a big difference. Well, I really appreciate your visit with us and and putting together this volume. It's called Getting the Most Bang for the Education Buck. Uh, Edited work, Brandon uh, Wright, one of the editors, FordhamInstitute.org. Um, And lots of great minds all contributing to this. Uh, And I really appreciate you sharing your insight and some of theirs as well with us this week on Freedom and Prosperity Radio. Thank you so much for uh, having me on. Coming up next, Scott Cosenza on the Supreme Court. Any news about the Supreme? I heard something in the news about the Supreme Court. We'll get into that coming up next on Freedom and Prosperity Radio.